Well, Father, we are grateful for your grace and mercy that has given us everything pertaining to life and godliness. We already have all that we need. There's not one single moment of our life where we're not fully supplied. Should, be, should we be willing to see it that way? It's our desire for more. This image in our mind that we need to compete or have a certain level that we don't have that destroys our contentment. So give us wisdom today, Father, and more than, more than wisdom, give us the courage, the determination to live these things out. We might be lights in a dark generation, and we ask it in Christ's name, amen. Well, it's been a while since I've been able to speak face-to-face -face with you, and I want to tell you all that, uh, that I've missed you very much. I mean, we've been here, but I love you very much. The eight of my family does, and we're in a, we're, we're in a, a time of application. We're in a time of trusting the Lord. So we appreciate you trusting with us for your prayers, for whatever support that you might be able to give. And, uh, you know, if you, if, you are, if you are in need spiritually, then I'm always available. I don't think Ron's too available right now, but you can, cut, you can get in touch with me. I can get in touch with him. We can help you out. I teach every Sunday at 5 o'clock on Facebook Live and also on Wednesday night with Dr. Patel at 7 p.m. Uh, those are all interesting. This is one of the things I've been teaching. So if you'll look at your page, this is out of Colossians 1. I've been in the book of Colossians. You know how we get bogged down, but I've been using it to teach different doctrines. Wonderful, wonderful study. In verse 9 through 11, this is Paul's prayer for the Colossians, the church in Colossae. For this reason, since the day I heard of you or your faith, we, he and his team, have not ceased to pray for you and ask, here's, the, here's what he's been asking, that you might be filled with the knowledge of his desire by means of all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, pleasing him in all respects or in every way, Bearing fruit in every good work, and, in, and, and, see, and we're back to knowledge, increasing in the knowledge of God. See, we got different levels of knowledge. Then he says in verse 11, made powerful. Now, this is my translation. Your Bible's not going to read this, but made powerful with unlimited power, operating under his glorious authority to develop all endurance and patience joyfully. Now, in my study on Sunday afternoon, I'm at the point of teaching joy. I've taught quite a few things, but this is one of Paul's recorded prayers. You know, you don't know what all he, he prayed for people. He might have prayed that, you know, their car get fixed and their cat get out of the tree and stuff. I don't know. But whenever you see Paul praying recorded, it's about spiritual matters, mostly about growth, because this guy's a teacher. So the main verb in this sentence, 9 through 11, is, a, is, a, is one idea, is that they may be filled with the knowledge of God's desire. Now, this is not God's will in the sense of bulamai, the plan of God, you know, the divine decree. This is the word thelema, which is God's wish. You know, there's God's, God's plan, his divine decree knows everything that's going to happen. But God's desire is for us to make the right choice every single time. Okay? So what the writer, what Paul's trying to say, I want you to understand the right choice, what, what the right choice that God has for you in this moment every time. What does God want for you? It's never what God wants from you. It's always what does he want for you? So this is God's desire for his child, for you. And he says, as they grow in understanding of his desire for them, they're able to walk worthy of the Lord. That word worthy means equal in value. Pleasing him in every, way, in every way, bearing fruit in good works. And then this, this, this level of growth leads them to the next level of knowledge and understanding. Have you not gone from 
the simplicity of confession of sin and walking in the Spirit to deeper levels of understanding not only God's plan but your own self, your own person, and how all this works in the, in the political world and all the whole history. Angel, you see, it gets deeper. And I believe it's a, it's a bottomless well. Of course, God is infinite. Therefore, God's knowledge is infinite. We're not going to get to the depths of it in this life. So these ever-deepening cycles of growth build our spiritual strength. He says, made powerful by unlimited power so that we are able to do two things, well, really four things, but endure difficult circumstances, that's endurance, and then be patient with people. Then he says, joyfully. All of this joyfully. Then he's going to say in verse 12, which is still part of this, with gratitude. One of the ways that you know that you're doing it, you're moving well, is that you, you have, you have an, uh, an undercurrent of joy in your life because you know the end of the story. I mean, have you already read ahead to the end? You know that you win, right? You know that no matter how bad it is right now in your life, you're going to win? And that's right. So we get, that gives you joy. That gives you confidence. That gives you peace. Then he says with gratitude. See, gratitude may be the, the best gauge of where you are in your life, spiritually speaking. How grateful are you? How, how preoccupied are you still with your problems? I mean, how, how, preoccup, how, how is it that you still see them as problems? instead of opportunities. You do realize that everything that happens in your life comes, through, comes across God's desk and that he uses it for your growth and his glory. You do know that, right? Yes, yes. So what you're calling a problem is really an opportunity to trust him for your growth. It grows you. See, when you trust God and he comes through, it impresses you once again of his faithfulness, that you've got his promises. You know, I was reading this Deuteronomy 8. He said, I led you in the desert, talking to the Exodus generation, I led you in the desert to humble you and to reveal what was, reveal what was in your heart, whether you would obey me or not. And I realized that that God's not saying, I, I did that so that I could see what was in your heart. See, he clearly already knew what was in their hearts. He did it so that they could see what was in their hearts. Would you obey me or not? And he, and he said, I fed you, I let you get hungry, and I fed you with manna, which you did not understand. Do you remember the rest of that? Do you know why he gave them manna? so that you might know that man does not, does not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. What that says is that the promise of God is worth a zillion times more than a bird in the hand. You got bread frozen in the freezer? Promise of God is worth way more than that. Can you walk through? See, it's a possibility that our nation's about to go through tre tremendous adversity. Tremendous adversity. We're at a point in history where that's just a logical, a logical movement. I mean, we've, we've, as a nation, we've asked for it. I mean, we've been buttering ourselves up to be shoved in the oven with taking God out of everything, allowing evil people to take over our public uh, services, our education. I mean, we allowed evil people to come in and just infest our education system. It's infested. I mean, you can't go against it anymore. So it's no wonder that we're in a great place of turmoil. I mean, I hope you're not surprised by that. But the question is, can you ride through this? I mean, what if it gets really bad like Rome? What if you really come under persecution? What if becoming a Christian becomes illegal? What if you get persecuted for real? 
You know, God can bring about anything he wants, but you do know your greatest opportunity to honor and glorify him and get rewarded is under extreme persecution. Now, who wants that? Any takers? Who's willing, who's willing, who's so in love with the Lord and so inspired and part of the plan on the team that you're willing to go through the utmost human suffering to glorify him. There you go. That's right. I'm working on it. Ah, uh, you know, I, I look at it, I'm looking at it over there sideways. I'm not ready to go jump on it, but you know, you don't listen. And you don't get to do that without all the years of preparation and reaching super gross. You know, we were filling out a card this morning. I know I'm streaming. And Rhonda said, well, what should we write? I said, well, don't eat the yellow snow. Uh, you know, and you should grow in grease and knowledge until you reach super gross. And uh, she didn't like that. But uh, anyway, that was my joke. Apparently it didn't work. So, well, this is Paul's prayer. I want you to see a couple of things before I talk about contentment. And that is when he, he talks about being made powerful by unlimited power. And this unlimited power, everywhere you study this word dunamis, it has two uses primarily. One is in, is in miracles. The miracles of Jesus, the miracles of Paul, the miracles. And the other is in the transformation of the believer. You see, the great power that God has given us is not to do miracles. The great miracle is the transformation of your soul. That's the miracle. That's the power. Imagine, here's a, here's a person born spiritually dead, separated from God, unable to understand God, with a sin nature in the devil's world, with sinful parents, that you're talking about behind the eight ball. And yet God's grace is able to take that person and lead them to be saved. And then after salvation, to lay aside their lies and their defenses and their mechanisms and their self-deception and literally come to a place where they love God and his plan more than they love their own self or their own human agenda. That's a miracle. That's power. Listen, that's why the mature believer, the believer that will stay faithful and grow and reach maturity and go through these things with grace and just being able to endure and be patient, Talking about glorifying God. That's why the Lord took Job and said, check it out. Check this guy out. You want to see something wonderful, Lucifer? Here's something wonderful. That's who we get to be. All this teaching that we, this faithfulness of Ron Adam all these years for us to be able to be at this place when, when everything hits the fan, to be prepared to glorify the Lord because we just stick it out. We trust him, we trust him, we trust him. We endure, we're patient, we're kind. We're lights in a dark world. That's what all this preparation's been for. Well, hey, here it comes. Are you ready? Yep, hopefully. So, I want to say one other thing. This word, this if you look at the passage, I don't know if you're, if you're looking at it or not, but he says you're made powerful with unlimited power. And then he says something about according to his glorious might. Well, that word might is not a power word. It's an authority word. And it literally means under God's authority structure. Here's what I got from it, and that is that the world has an authority structure. Even God has allowed a governmental structure. But this, this is the word that Jesus used when he said, all authority has been given to me under, uh, in heaven and on earth. This is the word. 
Therefore, go ye therefore and make disciples under his authority. So here you are walking into the courtroom. See, here's, here's Peter and James and John. They walk into the courtroom, the Sanhedrin, the courtroom of Rome, and they say, you cannot teach in this man's name. And they go, well, you know what? We're under his authority. We're, his authority supersedes yours, and we're under his. So we'll recognize yours when it's appropriate, but we're under his. His supersedes. The authority that we have, listen, we have the authority to speak the word of God no matter what. No matter what. You're under the authority. You've been authorized to tell people about Christ in the grocery store, at your work, Wherever you go, you've been authorized to do that. So, and finally, I believe that for God to take this person we just described and bring them into this mature place where they can trust the Lord no matter what, I think this might be the greater things that Jesus was talking about. You're going to do greater things than I do. See, it's the same, same, they're talking about the miracles, the dunamis, Jesus is, later on, Paul's going to use this dunamis word to describe our spiritual growth. Jesus is going to say, your dunamis is going to be greater than mine. He said, I, I can speak and something happens. Look at what it takes to go from being on the devil's team to being sold out for God. That takes a lifetime, right? That's a greater thing. So... Just a little no extra charge. Now, let's talk about contentment. We're in this study on Colossians 1, and, and this afternoon I'll be doing a, another version of this study, but uh, we're doing joy and happiness. I talked about human happiness last time, and I want to discuss contentment. The word archeo means to have enough, to be sufficient, to be satisfied, to be content. For instance, the, to, the, it's translated enough in Matthew 25, 9, talking about the wise, virgin, wise virgins had enough oil for their lamps. You know, there were some, the foolish virgins let their oil run out. The wise had enough. Uh, in John 16, 7, uh, 16, uh, Philip told the Lord, 16 denarius. A denarius was a day's wage for the average person. 16 days' wages wouldn't be enough to feed these people. You know what the Lord told Philip? He said, you feed them. You feed them. You know what happened that same night? Peter walked on water. What is it that we're capable of in the will of God? I don't know. Could you walk on water, Gary? I don't know. If the Lord said to walk on water, would you walk on water? I don't know. Now, 2 Corinthians 9, 8 says, God always provides enough for us to be generous and to do his will. Always provides enough for us to do his will. What if there's been, a, uh, there's been talk, if you keep up with the talk, that the, the next shortage is going to be about food? bottlenecks and all this kind of stuff, food shortages. So what if you had money, but you couldn't, there was no food to buy? Could you get through that? I don't know. Could you pray and ask God to send you food? You think God would? Think he'd use like a crow? Go steal food from your unbelieving neighbor and bring it to your house? Who knows? I'm going to tell you, every single day that you're alive here, just understand this, you have enough. You have enough. You have enough to do God's will. Here's, the, here's what I say to myself. If I have enough for today, then I have enough. If I have enough grace assets and provisions to get through the day and do God's will today, by the time I get up in the morning, out of heaven, he will have launched what I need and when I awaken, it will be there. Enough for how much? The next day. 
the next day. That's really a wonderful way to live. That's how the disciples end up living. They gave up all the work and savings and 401ks. They just gave all that up. People still did that, and believers still did that, but they just gave it all up. They said, too much trouble. You know, we know we're here. We know what we're here to do. And so God's going to send us what we need every single day to do what we're here to do. And we're not, we don't care what we wear or where we live, what we drive. You know, as long as we can get to the mission, we're good. Don't matter. See, that's enough. That's when you have enough. But if you're all sucked up into the world, competing with the world and, and where you live is important and, and what it looks like and the clothes you wear and all these things, if that's what your life's about, you go, well, it's not about that, but I still like those things. Look, okay, it's up to you. You can go as far as you want with the Lord. I mean, you, could you imagine getting so far and so invested in the Lord that those things really didn't matter? And it, he, if he called you, you could just walk away? Just walk away. And go do God's will. There may come a day when we have to do that. There may come a day. I mean, I've read books on what happens in a nation where communism takes over. Those are real possibilities now. This is a terrible, awful, godless, totalitarian system that's being proposed for America in this election. Who'd have thunk it? Who'd have ever thought that America would be at that point? I tell you who thought it was Bob Thane. <laughs> 50 years ago, he thought it. All right. The word sufficient, 2 Corinthians 12, 9, my grace is sufficient. This is Paul, and I'll talk about it in a minute. Paul found that what God had given him was sufficient for his needs. The word satisfied, he, uh, John the Baptist told the soldiers, be satisfied with your pay and the idea of content. Hebrews 13, 5 says, live free from the love of money. And this has to do with greed, the, the desire for more, 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 more. You do know that when you give in to the more, more, more system, there is never enough. The more, more, more love of money, greed system is the opposite of contentment. The opposite. Contentment says, I have enough. I have enough. I don't need more. Okay. Now, the idea of contentment is that God provides enough for every day as we acknowledge his provision and we can view it as enough. Here's the trick. The, the fact is you have enough. You say, well, you don't know how low it is. Probably do, but it's enough. You know how I know that? Because the promise of God said it is. You don't know my situation. Listen, God knows your situation. If you needed more to do his will, you'd have more. Listen, most of us have way more a hundred times more than we need, a million times more than we need. We got a lot more than we need to do God's will. I mean, we just have taught ourselves and told ourselves and trained our minds to believe that we have to just have this level of standard of living in order for us to be okay. You know that's not true. I'm not advocating you give it up or throw it away or give it to your neighbor. I'm just saying it may come a day, you know, for the first time in my lifetime, there's a possibility that we could come to a place like that. And then, see, you're going to have to be able to trust the Lord and say, okay, I have enough to do God's will for today. I don't know about tomorrow. I don't know about tomorrow. I don't know where we're going to live. You know, we may be homeless. We may be on the street. Maybe we're in jail. You know, maybe we're in the arena about to become a, a big torch. You have enough. You have enough. So, to be pleased, satisfied with what God provides and allows, 
realizing that what he gives you is sufficient. That's what he told Paul. So secondly, contentment is related to God's will, God's provision, and our circumstances. See, contentment is a circumstance word. For the most part, it can be a relationship word too. It applies to both. It's based on the fact or the belief that God is in control of your life as far as the outside. He's in control of the weather. I, I, I didn't realize that climate change was making these people go out and start these fires. Uh, it was just confusing to me, but okay. Uh, but contentment says God's in control. God's, God's got a plan for what he's going to allow in the outside of my life. Also, God has made provision for the inner side of my life, all right, for me to have the resources within. But see, you can't just, it can't just be a bunch of Bible verses. You have to know and understand the principles. That's why we do categories. You have to have practiced, exercised the principles, Hang on one second. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14. You know what that says? Solid food is for the mature who because of practice have, had, have trained their perceptive faculties to discern good and evil. Training. Verse 8. Verse 8. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. I know it. Having been made perfect, he became to all who obey him the source of eternal salvation, being designated by God as a high priest according to order. Now, when Jesus died, when he earned this for us, you know what he owned? Clothes on his back. You think he was discontent because he wanted you know, a house in Martha's vi vineyard or whatever it is, you know? I don't think so. I don't think he's worried about that at all. I mean, he wasn't looking for, you know, a grape orchard so that he could... Anyway, you get the point. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. If you'll go to that with me, 2 Corinthians 9, 8. Let's look at that. This is a really important concept. And when you start to think it through and you start to try to understand what is the basis of Paul's thinking, what is the basis of what God's telling him? God says, listen, I've already given you what you need. Now, if you could just hear that right there, if you could hear that one statement, if God were to say to you right now, and this is what he would say, He'd say, look, Al, I've, given, I've already given you what you need. You already have it. It's either in the Word of God, it's in your life, it's in your circumstances, or in your soul. I've already given you what you need. Why are you asking me for more? I've already given it to you. That's what he said to Paul. So, 2 Corinthians 9. Wait, that's, that's uh, I'm sorry, I'm ahead of myself. That's the, that's the giving passage, 9-8. These Macedonian believers gave out of their poverty, and he said, God is able to make all grace abound to you. That word abound, that's a pretty big word, you know it? It means to overflow. God is able to make all grace overflow to you so that always, that's at every time, having all sufficiency in everything you may have an abundance for every good deed. Now watch this. You say, boy, you know, I read that verse. At, at all times in every area of my life, God has given me enough. And you go, well, what about my relationships? I mean, uh, it's not working out. You're telling me God's given me enough? Yeah, for right now. He's given you everything you need for right now. You certainly don't want him to give you more than you need in that area before it's time before you're ready. So you just learn to be content with that. You go, okay, I'm waiting on the Lord. What you have from the Lord is enough. 
It's enough. It's abounded to you. It's overflowed to you so that you have enough to in turn allow it to overflow to others. Yep. Overflow to others. There was a guy I know ran into somebody. They, this, his family had two cars. They weren't the greatest cars, but they had two working cars. Ran into a guy that had no cars, didn't have a car to get to work. So what did he do? Gave him his car. Gave him his car. He said, we can live on one car. We can make it work. Share the resources. Why? Not trying to build anything. Well, you could have sold that car. You could have traded it in. You could have got something for it. Well, the guy said, I really did get something for it. I got to be, I was able to give like the Lord gives. Cool, huh? Hebrews 13, 5, let your soul be free from the love of money. Now, we know the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And you don't get to a place of maturity with usually with you still being in love with money, with more, more, more money. Often we think of money as security. We think of money as freedom. Maybe, you, maybe you've got, maybe you're a collector. You know, you collect all kinds of widgets or whatever. So you're using your extra money to buy widgets from all over the world to put in your box so that when people come to your house, maybe once a year, you can go on them, show them, look how many widgets I've got. I've got the one that everybody wants. And you're like, boy, that was a big deal, wasn't it? That saved a lot of souls. You know, that fed a lot of missionaries. That supported a lot of pastors to teach the Word of God. Now, I'm not fussing at you. I'm just saying, what are we doing with what God gives us? He says, free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. So why is it that we can be content? Because we've got, the, we've got every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We've got the promises. Now, if you went home today and your wonderful, beautiful home had burned down, Oregon, California, one guy said, burn it on down, Lord. <laughs> Run them all into the ocean. I thought, well, that's a little hard there, but understand the concept. But what if you went home and everything was gone? It was all gone. Your pictures, your memorabilia. You know, all, the only thing left was your little puppy dog that came running up to you. Could you trust God to, for him to do it all over? Could you trust God for that? You say, sure, I got insurance. Got insurance. What if the insurance companies fail? Now there's another hurricane coming. What if they fail? I mean, how many billions of dollars have been burned up in these cities? Insurance companies are going to have a hard time. All right. The basis of our contentment and freedom from needing more money is that we have Christ and his incredible promises to never abandon us. Now let's get to Paul in 2 Corinthians 12. If you'll turn over to 2 Corinthians 12 with me, I would be very grateful See, where you are in your life right now may be a difficult place in your mind, but it's really where the Lord wants you to be, and you have what you need. You have what you need. There was a time in my life when I thought that I needed my parents. I didn't need them, but it was really good to have them. Now they're gone. It was nice to have them, but that, now they're gone. Did I, do I need them now? Apparently not. Apparently not. So Paul says, 2 Corinthians 12, 7, he's got this thorn. Oh, and because of the surpass, this is called providential preventative suffering, where the Lord humbles you before you get a chance to be arrogant. That's called a preemptive preemptive strike. 
So you, you, wonder, you wonder why you're suffering so much. Well, listen, it's because you're so great. You didn't know that, did you? Well, I must be really great <laughs> or really bad. Now, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelation, this is Paul went to heaven and came back. For this reason, to keep me from promoting myself and bragging on myself, the Lord gave me or was given to me a thorn in the flesh, some kind of physical ailment, a messenger, messenger of Satan to punch me, to keep me from exalting myself again. Yeah, so concerning this, I prayed to the Lord three times that he would take this away. After the third time, I realized, and this is the perfect tense, that he had already said to me. Y'all know this passage. I realized he had already said to me. This wasn't like a new message. This wasn't like the God, the God spoke to him new. He realized he had already heard this message. He already understood this concept. It was in the word of God. See, you already have what you need. You're looking for something more, but you already have. How much of this have you availed yourself? How, seriously, seriously, how, how really dedicated are you to this? You come once a week and you think that's it. I mean, how dedicated? And here's another question. How dedicated are you to try to make this work? I mean, is it just another Bible study? You're, you, you're being faithful to show up and hear another Bible study, and you're like, Man, I got it made. I'm doing the right thing. Now listen, guys, this is, this is your life. Colossians 3 says, when Christ appears, who is your life? This is your life. There is no other thing than this. The rest of the stuff that we're caught up in, it's a distraction. It's just the stage on which we play this out. It doesn't matter. The fact that it matters to you, it still matters to you, is that you've still allowed all of your beliefs to have these hooks in you that have hooked you to the world. You're hooked to the world and what people think about you and how you look and where, what you drive and where you live. And you want to be proud. You want to be able to compete. Listen, I understand all this. I, I, I'm just like everybody else. But the will of God is for us to let those things go and, and return those things to the earth where they came from and live for Christ. You're capable of entering into that journey. You should already be in that journey. Hopefully we're in that journey. And we're, and we're moving to a place where we're willing to let go of these. Listen, when your desires and your faith is hooked to all the wrong stuff. Are you honest enough to admit that? I mean, you say, oh, I've got to have those things. I got to have my house. I got to have this. I got to have that. You know, I got to have the status. I need people bragging on me. I need people to think I'm great. I need the recognition. I mean, are you still hooked on that? I understand. Look, Rhonda and I, we talk about this stuff all the time. We teach this all the time. We're like, what is it? You got this negative feeling. You're like, what is that? Why do, listen, with all that I have in the Lord, why do I have a, de a depressed feeling or an angry feeling? What is that? Well, it turns out to be some image in, in my head that says I ought, to be, I ought to have this. My life ought to be like that. Why isn't my life like that? Frustrated. And the Lord says, why isn't your life like that? Why do you think your life needs to be like that? What it, let's pretend for a moment that your life, boom, became like that. What would be better? How would you be better able to serve me and witness for me and, and love and let love pass through you if you had that? I'm like, well, now that you put it that way, I guess I really don't need that. I say, Lord, but I really do need a boat. I mean, I do. I really need a boat, Lord. You know, even the Lord had a boat. 
He was in boats all the time. So, Jesus, I want to be like you within boats. I'm just teasing. If you do have a spare boat, though, let me know. Uh, Paul, the Lord said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. Now, my grace is, listen, here's what the Lord, here's what Paul realized the Lord had already taught him. You have what you need. You don't need anything more. Paul, you have sufficient resources and power, endurance and patience and virtue from the spiritual life to live your life in, with this thorn in your side in the flesh and be productive in spite of it. I mean, who here at our age doesn't have an ache or pain, doesn't have a physical difficulty? Who here is not having to push through and do the will of God in spite of some physical ailment or some other, some relational issue? Listen, life is, the devil's world is full of problems. We're not going to get problem-free. Problem, really, opportunity free but so this demon induced illness was was given him to keep him humble humble providential preventative suffering that's what bob thame called it so sometimes the difficulty in your life is a blessing and they're all blessings they're opportunities sometimes it's to keep you from making big mistakes you don't understand why God's allowing this in your life. You don't have to know. You just have to accept it that this is what today brings. This is the, this is the issue of the day, and I have enough. Maybe it's to keep you from making terrible choices. Paul prays. Hey, isn't prayer a good thing? Boy, that's legitimate, isn't it? Not, but, but not always. See, that wasn't his answer. Prayer wasn't the answer. Prayer was the answer to hear the promise that he'd already learned when he was trying to get God to change his circumstances. I told some guys yesterday in our school, we're, we're in a Christian problem-solving class. I said, when we start off in Christianity, we all have this human agenda, this image in our mind of what it would take for me to be happy. And we try to get God to make our dreams come true. And I say, you know, for the most part, God says, I don't think so. That's not what you need. And what God lets those dreams do is come apart. All the things you thought you were going to get, you know, you were going to get married and have this romance every night. It was going to be candlelight and dancing and smooching and loving every night. Yeah, I mean, your marriage is that way, isn't it? Of course it is. You didn't get what you wanted. What you got was what you needed. See, it's really about growth more than it is about pleasure. But Paul said, God said to Paul, you have what you need. Now, what is it that you don't think you have right now that you think you need? I mean, what is it? Is it more money? You say, I need to make more money. You know, really, why? Why do you need more money? Well, I'm trying, we're trying to, yeah, I know you're trying. You got some dream, you got some image, trying to build something new, something bigger. Got to have something bigger. Why? <laughs> I was going to do this Noom thing, and uh, <laughs> I just found them to be very, very invasive. Uh, you know, they just kept saying, why do you want to lose weight? Me and Rhonda are driving in the car, and she's reading it. She said, why do you want to lose weight? I said, well, so I'll look better. She goes, is that the real reason? Well, no. I mean, so we get down to like five different levels of why. And I finally thought, you know, the real reason why I should want to lose weight is because this is the Lord's temple, and I want to please him. That should be the real reason. And that was like a revelation to me. This wasn't about me and my belly. This was about me being content in the Lord. So, Paul has enough. 
the Lord says, my grace provision that I've already given you is exactly what you need to endure the adversity of your life today. Do you understand that? Do you believe that? Are you able to be content with that? What is, what is dragging you away from the contentment of, of being content with what you have? What is it that is hindering you from being able to go there and stay? I mean, what is it that you want or think you need that you don't have? Do you really need it? See, you can either keep hounding the Lord and working your tail off to try to get that thing, and once you get it, you won't be any happier than you are right now, or you can do this. You can unhook it from you, from your beliefs and your images and your ideas. You can let that thing just go on, float off like a balloon, and be free. Be free. See, Paul's image was a life free of pain. He wanted to have good health and a life free of pain. Wouldn't we all like that? That's not what God, God said. I've given you what you need. Now, when you believe that and you're okay with that, then you can be content. So, God's power, his dunamis, is the power in dwelling Paul. See, when he says, my power is made perfect in your weakness, this is the same dunamis out of Colossians 1, the same dunamis that did the Jesus, the miracles of Jesus and the miracle. These are the, this is the miracle power. Dunamis is the miracle power. The miracle is for Paul to be able to look at these difficult circumstances and be content, not have to have this fixed. Be content. That's the miracle. That's the greater thing than, than what I've done. So this demon-induced illness was given to Paul by God's power to enable him to grow spiritually so that he would lay aside his earthly attachment of trying to live without pain. So who wouldn't like to go through life and never have an ache or pain? Never, never, never have your knees go out. Three back surgeries. Have to live with a perfect woman who makes you look bad every day. When you compare yourself to her. I mean, it's just like right up there with Jesus, you know. Uh, so, now, is this thorn a blessing or a cursing? It's a blessing. It's an opportunity to use God's power, let go of that whole idea of being free from pain, to live in pain, to live gratefully in pain, to live joyfully in pain. Did you know you can be joyful and grateful even though you're suffering great pain? Even though you've lost a loved one? While you're grieving, you can be joyful and grateful? You say, I don't want to grieve. I don't want to feel. So this is what happens to us. We don't want to feel pain at all in our life. And so when we do feel pain, because God has allowed circumstances that create pain, we interpret them in such a way that they create pain. We don't want that. And so we take that pain and we stuff it. Stuff it down in a hole and cover it over. And we move on with our life as if somehow we've resolved that appropriately comes back to bite you secondly spiritual growth in the surrendered life of the super mature believer is the greater things that jesus said the church age believer would do god's plan to is allow is to allow adversity in the believer's life giving you an opportunity to trust his promises that he always honors building our trust and revealing his faithfulness Every time he honors it, our, our faith is built, strengthened. That's the dunamis. God's power, God's desire was for Paul to use his grace assets to endure the thorn. Trust him for the capacity to have joy in spite of it rather than use prayer to remove it. 
when Paul removed the belief that he must be pain-free for him to be effective for the Lord or to be happy in his life, he was able to embrace a mental image of God's power enabling him to be joyful through the pain. So, Paul stopped seeing this image of being pain-free and strong and healthy as his means of glorifying the Lord. He threw that away. He erased it out of his head, and he went over to this image of God enabling him to live with the pain, in spite of the pain. That was the will of God. He gained a new level of appreciation for the depths that he had to endure to gain the heights of the spiritual life. Remember Acts 9, 16, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my namesake. Not only was God's provision sufficient, Paul, listen, not only was the provision sufficient, Paul came to see it as sufficient. Two different things. Here's what I'm telling you. Your provision from God today, right this moment, is sufficient. If it wasn't, God would give you more. Right? I mean, is God, is God sleeping on the job? He's got an accounting problem. He didn't quite a lot enough to you. No, of course not. It's just that we don't see it that way because we've got some other image in our mind about what it's supposed to be. See, that's the laying aside of the old stuff. Now, thirdly and finally, the secret, you know, he says in Philippians 3, Philippians 4 about the secret. The secret of living the contented life must be learned by walking with the Lord, realizing that what he's given us in the moment is exactly what we need to be victorious. Philippians 4, 10, I mean 4, 10 through 13. The, the Philippian church, I mean, yeah, the Philippian church has sent him a gift, and he's so glad he needed it. But he said, look, I, I'm good either way. I'm good either way. I, I know how to live without. I know how to live with abundance. And he said, the secret, I know I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both having an abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. And again, this strength, you know what the strength is? It's the dunamis. Same thing. This the miracle power to transform. The great miracle of the church age is the power to transform, to lay aside old ways of thinking and, and embrace the new way in Christ. That's the miracle of the church age. So here's something interesting. This word to learn, I've learned the secret. It's, it's Montano, and it means, it means to learn as a disciple. It's not to learn in classroom like this. A disciple, a Montano, would learn by living with the person, by walking. See, the disciples were Montanoing. They were learning from Jesus by being with him all the time. Paul said, you learn this secret by walking with the Lord. You don't learn it in Bible class. You hear about it in Bible class, but you learn it through living life, walking with the Lord. You Montano it. And then he says... Of course, this secret is a mueo. It means it's like the, the secret in uh, programs, the, you know, the, the clubs and all that. It's the church age doctrine. He learned when he watched God's provision for every contingency of his storied ministry, he had, been, he had learned that what God had already given you at the moment is all you need for that moment. He had learned the secret, the mueo. He had become initiated in one of the, one of the mystery religions, i.e. Christianity. God had always provided for the needs of his divine agency in every period. God's going to give you what you need. Now, finally, the secret to continued living cannot be learned in the classroom alone. The overriding principle of God's plan for the church age is taught in Romans 8.28. God is working everything for divine good. Therefore, we learn through the word and through the personal experiences of walking with God that whatever he allows in your life is intentional. It's no accident. This is intentional. You go, God, this is killing me. This is terrible. It's intentional. Now, you can either get mad at him, shake your fist, 
Or you can try to go, you can ask the question, Lord, what is this for? What is the purpose of this? And he says, I led you into the desert to humble you and reveal what was in your heart. The secret is that happiness is based on a surrendered love relationship with him. Knowing that he's in charge of your circumstances, gratefully playing the part he allows us to play in the drama of the angelic conflict. The secret is believing that he's got your best interest in mind, that he is good, that he loves you, that what he's got in your life right now or what he's not got in your life right now is exactly what ought to be. It's what you need. It's what is best for you. If you needed more, he'd give you more. If you needed less, he'd take it away. He is in charge. He knows what he's doing. Now, when the voices come that say, I'm not happy with this. I don't want to live like this. This is something I can't accept. You got to say, I'm not listening to that. I'm not listening to that because I know that's not true. That flies right in the face of the biblical idea that God has given you what you need. Flies right in the face. You got to go, no, I'm not listening to that. Of course, you got to be listening to your, what you're saying to even hear it in the first place. If you're not in oblivious in autopilot, you know, just running through your life, going from one circumstance to the next. You stop and think and pay attention and listen to what you're saying and pay attention to the Holy Spirit. You hear these voices go, you got to have more. Oh, wouldn't that be nice? Man, I need to work hard and get that. Well, wouldn't everybody be, what? I can't imagine the faces when people saw me wearing that. I mean, whatever it is you tell yourself, whatever your area is, what is your area? I mean, where do you waste money? resources, time. Listen, money is the least of our resources. It's time. Time is the thing you can't get back. Time. Who gets your time? Does the television get your time? Wow, what a waste. I mean, who gets your time? Who gets your finances? Who gets your resources? Who, who, who's the object of your thinking and your desires and what do you think about what do you dream about and long for what do you what is that in your life listen that's what keeps you from being content if god look god may want to give you those things at some point so look let those things go say if you want that's fine but let it go let it go grab a hold of him live for today one day at a time Let's see. I guess we're going to have to quit unless y'all want to go another hour or two. Uh, Wednesday at 1130 on, I guess it's, is it on Facebook? Is that where it works? Is that how it is, John? YouTube, Doctrinal Studies. Uh, all right. Just be sure to plug into that. We'll have another lesson similar to this. Uh, be sure to pray for Ron and Jane, uh, for Gary, Gary Horton. And uh, all right, let's let's close. Pray for Rick's ministry, uh, for Joe Sam. This great thing that's going on there. This is a dang revival. This is a grace revival in Myanmar. My my, my, my how to say it again? Malawi. Malawi. Yeah, there you go, man. So you just live your life and you're faithful and God gives you this thing and you, you go over there and give it and the next thing you know, it's going everywhere. All right, Father, we are so grateful just to be part of this. Just, just to be the glove in which your hand fits. And I do pray for Joe Son, that you give him energy and, and resources and you strengthen his heart and his his ability to understand, that you give him great insight so he can teach. Uh, don't let the authorities in that country get in his way. I pray for Ron and Jane. I pray for Jane's legs for the infection, that you would just remove it. Now, I know we just talked about being content. 
And I'm asking you to heal her body so that she might have years more of service to you. That would be our desire. Help us at the same time be content with whatever you've already decided for her life and the, the length or brevity of it. Pray for Gary. I pray that you give him physical strength and you would open doors. Give him wisdom about what doors are and where to look for doors. Maybe, maybe there's a new way. I pray for our church, Father. I pray for the future, the grace ministry that has developed out of here for so long. We don't want that to come to an end, Father. We want it to go to another generation so that we can pass the torch. Give us the courage and the, the energy and the determination to pass these things to the next generation. We love you, Father. We praise you in Christ's name. Amen.